well. Brad Keithley comes in every week to talk about oil, gas, politics, the budget, and more. He was with us Friday when he had very little time to review the big budget that the House uh, majority pushed through. Now we've had a little bit more time to dissect it. Let's get down into it with Brad Keithley and see where we're at in the state government. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great this morning. How about you? Not too bad. Not too bad, my friend. Thanks for uh, nudging us on that podcast thing. We appreciate you doing that. Now you can get a chance to uh, share it with everybody out there. Congratulations. I, that's a that's a great fix. You and uh, and that guy on the other side of the window uh, uh, have done a great <laughs> job put, putting that together. So congratulations. Well, he's he's doing a lot of work over there. We won't we won't we won't take much from him when he's awake. He does great work. Um, <laughs> let's let's. Uh, Let's let's delve down into it. Uh, last Friday, you and I got a chance to talk a little bit about this uh, budget bill, the uh, operating budget that we stuffed inside of the uh, inside of the capital budget. 80, 80 plus pages, almost 90 pages of amendment in a single amendment going in there. You'd had about three hours to suss it out, and we're trying to figure out where all the money went. Any uh, any more luck since last week to look at this and see where we're at? Well, I've uh, I've spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to dig down into it, and and I think that the the headline note about this is that the Senate and the House are about 250 million dollars apart on the operating on the on the numbers in the operating budget. They're about 180 million dollars apart on the various line items, and then there and then the House struck all of the statutory oil and gas tax credits. Uh, which total about seven, seventy-five million dollars. So you add that to the hundred and eighty, and you got about two hundred and fifty million dollars. The differences. Uh, that's not enough to shut government down over. And and presumably, uh, people who wanted to avoid shutting government down uh, could come to a table, figure out uh, where the resolution spot is uh, in those two hundred fifty million dollars worth of differences, and and resolve it. The big issue to me um, that's 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 going to prevent uh, getting government uh, pr- prevent reaching that agreement if we don't reach that agreement is what to do about the PFD. The PFD uh, goes in the operating budget. Uh, the amount of the PFD is is set in the operating budget. Uh, the House did a trick last Thursday of trying to put part of it in the capital budget, but. But that's that's a that's a an exception. Uh, the PFD is normally resolved in the operating budget. So the question is, uh, what we're going to do about the PFD? The House, uh, as part of their declaration last Thursday, said they're not going to cut the PFD uh, if the Senate's not going to agree to an income tax. Um, and and so presumably the House is coming to the table this week saying we want the full PFD unless unless we resolve this other issue. But if all we're going to focus on is the operating budget uh, and we're not taking up those other issues, then then we want the full PFD. Presumably that's what they're coming to the table to say. The Senate right. presumably is coming coming to the table to say, look, we're going to 25%. We're going to POMV uh, and we're going to a 25% draw as opposed to a 50% draw uh, for the budget. And so we've got – and so there's a fundamental disagreement that's worth – uh, in the neighborhood of six hundred and fifty million dollars between the two of them uh, on that issue about what to do about the permanent fund. So that's PFD. So that's those are the two issues: two hundred fifty million dollars in line item stuff, um, and then and then what to do about the PFD. And and of course, the in taking this stance, the House majority has basically thrown again a bigger bone of contention into this because their I think it seems their attitude was, well, if we're not getting our income tax and you're not getting your PFD take, uh, is is pretty much the solution that came through. And I think you and I have talked about this that really, as as ugly as this is and as as contentious this whole thing has become, this really is our best case scenario where the the legislature <laughs> is faced simply with passing a budget. And then having to come back around and take another bite of the apple at whether or not revenues are actually needed or if another plan is actually uh, even, you know, if we even have to put anything together, right? Yeah, the fiscal plans have gotten so bad from the standpoint of the effect on the on the overall Alaska economy and Alaska families had gotten so bad that that, yes, crashing and burning in the way in the way that we have is is a better option than than pursuing either of those long-term fiscal plans. There are much better solutions, much better approaches to a long-term fiscal plan from the standpoint of the overall Alaska economy and Alaska families than 
than what those than what the two bodies have put on the table. So, yeah, I I, I think we have gained um, from a long term standpoint by crashing and burning uh, over those over the the, the the disputes over those plans uh, and focusing just on the operating budget. Um, but we've still got to resolve the operating budget, and there's still and, – and a piece, at least a piece of that long-term fiscal plan dispute is showing up in the operating budget in terms of what to do about the PFD. The – you know, part of the softening of this discussion, again, I think part of it was political, but part of it I think is a reaction from what the overall – uh, public backlash has been about taking the PFD. More and more people now are, are are starting to get vocal about it. I'm seeing more discussion on it now than ever before. Anecdotally, in the comment section of the different uh, news outlets and everything else, the vast majority of commentary is, you know, keep your hands off the PFD, live within your means. You know, I know X, I know Y people who've been fired, I know people who've been downsized, I know people who are leaving Alaska. I, I think they're starting to feel that pressure from the public. I think they are as well. There's a rally today. Um, I, I don't recall if you talked about it on the program or not, but there's a rally today uh, from 11 to 1 at the courthouse downtown uh, as, a, as, as a precursor to the oral argument that will occur before the Supreme Court later today on whether the, P, the PFD cut that the governor made last year, the veto, was, was constitutional, was, was, was authorized by the statute. Um, and and so there's there's going to be a rally uh, today at the courthouse on that, and and I think I, the the chatter I've seen about that on Facebook and elsewhere, uh, I think there's going to be more people uh, show up for that than than have shown up for rallies in the past, which is right. which is my way of agreeing with you that I think there is uh, an increasing public awareness. Of, of the impact of the PFD cut and in, increasing public resistance to things that are taking hands out of the or taking money out of the pockets of Alaskans. We saw it, we saw it in the news this past week news that Alaska's unemployment rate is the highest in the nation. Uh, that now we've seen uh, 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 rental rates in Anchorage uh, uh, starting to soften, which is sort of the canary in the coal mine uh, for what's going to happen to real estate prices. Uh, I think we're seeing the real impacts of of the recession that that we've gotten ourselves into uh, on individual Alaskans, and I think as they look at their checkbooks and they look as they start looking at their home values, uh, they're seeing that that you know money is uh, that money is going to be tight, tighter than it has been in the past, and I think they're worried about things that take you know additional money out of their pockets, like the PFD cut and like taxes. So. Yeah, I right. think there's a cre- increasing awareness. I heard Dunleavy talk about that yesterday with the the poll on the uh, from the Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, I, I, I or from the House Senate Majority. I think I think we're seeing uh, uh, that starting to snowball uh, uh, among among Alaska citizens. Well, and even uh, you you mentioned the uh, you mentioned the the survey on the on the uh, you know rental properties and everything else in Anchorage. That even out in the Matsu, where it has historically been, even when everything else was softening up, that was still very brisk and still they're seeing even in the Matsu that uh, that the that the real estate market is softening up, which again is even a, a better indicator, I think, uh, as an area that has gone through tremendous growth over the last five or six years. Uh, to show that it's even even they're being affected out there in the Matsu uh, as well, and um, and I and I think that that uh, I think that that plays right back into it. People are starting to see it. You know, your friends and neighbors uh, got an email last week from a listener uh, during our discussions on Friday that said, uh, you know, they just had 18 people laid off at their job. A couple of them had worked. One guy he said had worked there 27 years. He said mm-hmm. the oil patches. Is uh, things are getting tighter and tougher, and uh, the, the of course the trickle down and the secondary and tertiary effects of that for all the support industries that's just getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, and and you know the 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 mantra at the beginning of this legislative session was well we need to we we, we government need to respond to this by keeping government spending higher, keeping all you know government employees. We don't want to lay off government employees, so we need to. We need to be pulling money out of the private sector by cutting the PFD and talking about taxes to support government. That's our response to the recession. But, but as, we, as you and I have talked throughout this entire session, uh, that's, that's silly because you're pulling money out of the private sector where dollars have a bigger, bigger bang for the buck in terms of the overall Alaska economy. 
um, uh, we're pulling money out of the private sector to, you know, run it over to the government sector to keep government employed. Well, at, when we're doing that, we're taking money out of every Alaska citizen. A, a, a PFD cut takes money out of every Alaska citizen. And these are sizable PFD cuts that we're talking about. We're talking about taking, you know, 650, the Senate plan takes $650 million out of the hands of Alaska citizens, takes a billion dollars out of the economy by the time you, uh, you, you, you take into account the knock-on factor. And, and that's, I mean, that's a huge amount of money in a, in a $40 billion income uh, economy that we're, that we're pulling out of it. So, yeah, I think people are finally, are finally sort of understanding what the impact is on them individually and on their livelihoods of, of those sort of steps. In the beginning, it was sort of, yeah, okay, we'll move that money over to government. But now I think they're saying, wait, wait, that means you're taking it out of my pocket. Uh, right. And, and I, don't, I don't have as much money as I used to have, and now you're going to take right. even more. Uh, well, and I, and I, think that does, I think that does have a wake-up effect. Well, and it's not even a partisan issue. You mentioned the, uh, you know, you, you misspoke, but it was the Alaska Chamber of Commerce poll, and they had that new mm -hmm. survey that just came out. And even along party lines, they're talking about, you thinking of Alaska right now, do you think things are headed in the right direction, or do you think things have gotten off on the wrong track? 69% of Alaskans think that we're headed in the wrong direction, on the wrong track, and that's 67% of Democrats, 73% of Republicans, 64% nonpartisan, 68% undeclared. They all think that we are overwhelmingly headed in the wrong direction, but the legislature on both sides of the aisle are full steam ahead, headed in that direction. Yeah, it's 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 disappointing. I I, I don't think, frankly, uh, as as we've gone through the session and I've seen what the Senate's done and what the House does uh, House has done. I don't think, frankly, we get our act together until after the 2018 elections. I think that's where. The rubber finally finally meets the road. Four years after oil prices started the decline and made 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 apparent the track we were on anyway, sort of accelerated the track we were on anyway. Uh, but given where the Senate's gone, uh, the Senate Republicans of you know talking about PFD cuts and and the House of talking about a combination of PFD cuts and income taxes. Given where we've gone, I'm not I don't I don't in, unless one or the other is just willing to reverse themselves. And can convince the other of of that they need to reverse themselves. Also, I don't think we get this resolved until we go into the 2018 election. So, I, we're, we're in it for a while longer. And I think as people realize that, uh, they're they're having these poll, they're they're giving these responses to the to the pollsters about no, I don't I don't think we're going in the right direction. You're taking money out of my pocket in a recession at a time when I can least afford it. Uh, and and I yeah I, I think the more the longer this goes on, the more people realize what the impact of these proposals are on their personal economics. The more the the overall economic situation around us uh, declines. Uh, yeah, I, I I think there is going to be much an increasing amount of dissatisfaction. Well, and again, a final point out of that uh, survey. I mean, we were talking about the swing now in this uh, discussion about people's understanding that their PFD is getting cut in a single year. It has swung. The pendulum has swung from 56 percent supporting uh, a taking of PFD earnings uh, um, now has and, and guaranteeing a dividend of a thousand dollars has now dropped dramatically to under a majority. Now, a majority oppose that. Um, and so we've seen that 16 percent swing just since last year. And I think it's going to get even worse if they had another cycle where they tap the dividend one more time. You'll really see some uh, you'll see an even bigger swing as they move forward. Uh, your thoughts? Well, no, I agree with that. And I think, Michael, what's happening as I as I as I talk to people, as I listen, listen to, to, to talk radio, as I, as I read face comments on Facebook, um, and, and comments on Twitter and elsewhere. I think what's happening is, is, is the middle class, the, the, the sort of the, the, the nuts and bolts of Alaska, lower middle, middle, upper middle classes, those, those 20% brackets, I think they're waking up to what's going on. I think they see the impact on themselves personally of these PFD cuts. I've got a friend down in Kenai who's just, you know, who, who has really over the course of the last year really evolved from oh, yeah, I can give up a little bit to make sure government still operates, To Wait, you're taking that much out of my pocketbook? I've got four kids. You're taking that much away from me?
Yeah, it, it really makes a difference. Brad Keithley is our guest. We're continuing with more right here on your home for Common Sense Radio, The Michael Duke Show. Brad Keithley joins us again. Brad, you with us still? I sure am. Okay, let's uh, let's quickly take a call from Paul here before I jump down into this oil and gas tax credit question. Also, I want to talk a little bit about a spending cap question as well. Paul's on the line. Paul, what's on your mind for Brad? Paul? Final ask for Paul. All right, apparently we <laughs> lost Paul there. So, let's 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 get back to it, Brad. Uh, let's take those two. Let's take those two in reverse. Let's talk about the spending cap, because there is mm-hmm. uh, apparently a an a, 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 a effort to put on the ballot a spending cap in the state of Alaska. It would effen- essentially be like a taxing cap or a spending cap that would be adjusted for the rate of inflation and the cost of living index. Uh, something like this was attempted to be passed about 15 years ago, 16, 18 years ago, somewhere in there, and it failed. Um, but I think we were not in the same circumstances that we are today. Do you think this would have the effect that we're looking for that you and I talk about of trying to keep the pressure on government spending? Well, uh, it, it, yes, uh, the, it, the devil's in the details. It has to be the right kind of spending cap. Uh, but certainly a spending cap would be would be very useful in, in the right area. You and I, you know, when we began back when we began these broadcasts, uh, with these discussions, we were we were talking about sustainable budgets and the calculation of the sustainable budget. A sustainable budget is nothing more than a spending cap. It says, look, we can't afford to spend any more than X, um, uh, and and have a long term sustainable budget. Uh, put another way, along if we spend X now, we can continue to have uh, that sort of spending, that same sort of spending over time. Uh, through a combination of oil revenues uh, and and the use of the other 50% of the of the permanent fund earnings, as as Governor Hammond originally anticipated, that that was a spending cap back then. Uh, the legislature gave mouth service to it, lip service to it. In the 2012 elections, I recall individual legislators saying, "Oh yeah, we got to have a sustainable budget." I re- I recall a conference after the 2012 election uh, in December. That I co-chaired, Senator Kathy Giesel came up and said, "Yes, absolutely, we're going to have sustainable budgets. We're going to keep our spending within limits." Uh, in the prior year, the legislature had spent something like 7.9 billion dollars uh, against a sustainable number of roughly six billion dollars. Then, the next year, they brought it all the way down to 7.2. <laughs> so, right, right, and and the, and, the, and the sustainable budget fell away because we hadn't we hadn't kept within hadn't kept within that limit. So. I think I think legislators will talk all day long about their ability to limit spending uh, to to long term sustainable levels, and they will fail all day long when when left to their own devices down in Juneau, in the midst of lobbyists, in the midst, midst of a government company town. So yeah, I think I think a statutory or a constitutional provision uh, that limits spending uh, would be the right thing to do. We've actually got one in the Constitution now. The problem is the base was set too high, so by the time you apply all the ratchets to it, uh, it's it's way beyond spending the sustainable, long-term sustainable uh, limits these days. So that emphasizes the importance of getting it right, doing the details right, getting the right kind of spending cap right. Uh, but if you if you build it right, if you build it to to be a, a sustainable over the long over over the long haul build it around a long-term sustainable budget, I think it would do wonders in, uh, in getting uh, what's otherwise been uncontrolled an uncontrolled spending spree uh, uh, over the last oh, seven years, eight years, decade, really, getting an uncontrolled spending spree back under control. And it would put into statute what, again, what Hammond talked about in part with his plan on the 50-50. That essentially was a cap regulated to – uh, you know, to a specific, uh, you know, uh, tied to specifically to the economy and to the oil revenues, which, again, they paid lip service to and then blatantly ignored. Whereas if we had something like this into place, it would probably have disallowed a lot of the spending that we're seeing out there um, in the, uh, you know, out there in the last 10 years or so. Yeah, the, 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 the difference between a statutory cap and a, and a, const- and a constitutional cap is, is material. The, the legislature... Aided by this by Supreme Court interpretations, 
have essentially used the annual budget process to override statutes. A, a good example is uh, is the PFD statute. The PFD statute says you will take 50% of earnings and you will distribute it as dividends every year. And the legislature through the budget process said, nah, we don't want to do that. Uh, or the governor through the veto process rather said, nah, we don't want to do that. And so overrode statute. So you, you putting it in statute sets is, is more like a guide than an actual constraint. I think a guide is better than what we've got now. Uh, but if we really want to get serious about putting a tight spending cap on that can't be end run, uh, then we need to think about putting it in the Consti- Constitution. So the details are important about it, but the concept certainly is, is a solid one. All right. So this leads us to our previous discussion. You were mentioning that one of the places where the House and the Senate are far apart is obviously on the uh, uh, oil tax uh, credits. Uh, the House is, re- you know, basically taking it where or removed it down to the statutory minimum or taking it down to the statutory minimums. The Senate wants to give a little more. They wanted to give $288 million more to it. So wh- where, where are we at on this and wh- what does it spell as we continue to try and and, and suss out what this over the next 10 days, what this final budget's going to be. Yeah. So there's really two issues. One is what we do about in the, in the near term about oil credits, not the, in the, in the last budget, in the Thursday budget of last week, the Thursday night budget, sort of like the Saturday night massacre, right? The thir- Thursday, right, night, right. The, the Thursday night budget uh, what the house did was cut out oil tax credits entirely. Uh, they, they put it in a, in a separate piece of that bill, that, that was contingent upon the how the minority voting for a constitutional budget reserve draw. The minority didn't do that. And so oil tax credits came out entirely uh, out of that bill. So right now we've, we've got a wide gulf between what the House, where the House position is currently going into these discussions and where the Senate position is. We need to resolve that. And in my opinion, we should resolve it at the statutory, at the statutory $70 million. We need to live, we need to observe the statute we need to live up to our statutory obligations, but we don't need to be advance paying or prepaying uh, on those obligations as, as the Senate has proposed. That's one issue, what to do about immediate oil tax credits. The longer term issue is what to do about the oil, is what to do about those credits long term and what to do about overall uh, uh, oil taxes. What the House has proposed is to eliminate those cash credits going forward. Uh, and to significantly change tax rates in a way that would extract uh, more out of the industry going forward. Uh, The Senate has also proposed to eliminate uh, those cash credits in the near term, essentially allow producers uh, who are engaged in exploration activities that don't currently have taxable income to to keep keep their expenses incurred in exploration and then take them against taxes going forward. The House eliminates that. To me, cutting to the chase on the long-term plan, we need to do this. We need to eliminate the cash credits. I think they, I think if that program ever had value, and frankly, I don't think it did, but if that program ever had value, it's long since used it up, uh, and I, we need to eliminate the cash credits. But on the long-term tax rates, we need to set the tax rate at, at, at the level that we, at the maximum level we can without impacting, negatively impacting long-term exploration and, and oil development in this state. Right. We, we, from from in, under ACES from 2007 to 2013, when we changed SB 21, we had a net drop in, uh, in investment in the state compared with, with global development. That was sort of the heyday of global oil development, global oil investment. Alaska actually went down as a percentage of global oil investment because our tax structure was, our tax regime was too, took too much out of the industry. Uh, we need to set it at what that rate is. And frankly, I think the House goes beyond that rate uh, in some of the things they want to do. They, they're looking at it more as an income cash cow generator to the state. We ought to be looking at it as what does it take to keep industry in the state and strong uh, and, and continuing to invest in the state long term. And I think the House has gone past that point. Well, and they're not done. That's the other thing. They've already said that they're investing a half a million dollars already in, in more tax experts to explore the effect on taxation as a whole on the industry. Uh, I think they're signaling that they're not done with this debate. They want to revisit the whole SB 21 thing all over again, uh, because, again, they see this as a revenue generation line 
uh, because I think that the kind of the feeling in is amongst the House majority is that the oil companies have been screwing the state for so many years and we're not getting our fair share and they're reaping the rewards and nobody else is. Um, that that's kind of the general manifesto, it seems to be, from the House side. Uh, and uh, and so they're not done at this point. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Some of the experts they've hired, I, I like. Uh, they're, they're people I've worked with in the past, and they're people that I think understand the, the whole tipping point concept. You don't want to take taxes past uh, the tipping point where you start uh, 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 adversely affecting investment in the state. So I, frankly, some of that I think is good. We don't, we don't <laughs> We don't have a whole lot of expertise at the state level in, 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 in tax analysis, in oil industry tax analysis. We have some, but not a whole lot. And frankly, bringing in experts probably makes sense if you bring in the right experts, and some of those people are. So that's, that's probably a good sign. But we have, to, we have to, to, to look at taxes, not from the standpoint of who got screwed in the past, who did well, who got screwed in the past. This is a forward exercise. What, are we, what does it take? to continue to have to have a reasonable take of revenue but not take us past the tipping tipping point where we adversely affect investment and um, and that that needs to be the 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 standard we use uh in setting taxes going forward all right to down to the last two minutes here brad what happens in the next 10 days i mean we're we're down to it 10 days to a shutdown What, what happens next in your estimation uh, they they come they have to come to agreement on the line items they have to they have to close that 250 million gap uh, that exists between them counting the the different treatment of, of cash oil tax credits uh, now due so they so they have to they have to resolve that 250 million if it's 125 if they come to 125 I'm not going to scream bloody murder I think that's too much I think we're spending more than the sustainable level but. Well, I, I think I think the effects of shutting down are huge, and and so coming coming to a middle ground on that. We also have to they also have to come to agreement on the on the PFD. House says if you're not going to agree to income taxes, then we have to then we need a full PFD. Senate says we want the PFD at fifty at at twenty fifty percent of where it is currently at twenty five percent of earnings. Uh, they have to come to some agreement on that, and I hope it is much nearer the full PFD resolution than, than a deep cut to the PFD. Yeah, because we can't see that on the economy. It's the only way to keep things rolling. Brad Keithley, thanks for coming in and joining us, my friend. Appreciate you being part of the program today. Michael, thanks for having me as always. The Michael Duke Show. On your home for Common Sense Radio.